Good morning to everyone on Zoom and YouTube. My name is Leslie and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. Thank you for joining us on NParks Spotlight. Whether you are new or regular participants since June, a very warm welcome. As you know, this series casts the spotlight on Singapore's rich biodiversity. We featured several experts from NParks and in September, as part of our annual Festival of Biodiversity, our community partners have also joined us to share their knowledge of different species and habitats and answer some of your questions. Earlier this month, we've had sessions about reptiles, amphibians and raffles banded langers. We also heard about the close-knit community supporting Sisters Islands Marine Park and learned about the contributions of citizen scientists in gathering data about local bird life. And just last weekend, the two authors of Singapore's first ever guidebook on bees spoke about their collaboration. In all these talks, our speakers have used superb pictures and videos to bring their subjects closer to us, even as we meet online. So for our final talk today, we have a real treat. Our speaker is an expert in documenting elusive wildlife, and he'll share a few tips to not only capture them beautifully, but also ethically while keeping a safe distance. If you are fascinated by otters, I'm sure you would have marveled at Bernard Sia's pictures of smooth-coated otters in the media. Bernard is not just a talented photographer, he's also a dedicated volunteer with the Otter Working Group. As always, I'd like to remind those on Zoom that if you have any questions during the talk, do send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the chat, and we'll try to address a few of them later on. So without further ado, let's welcome Bernard Sia and allow him to captivate us with his words and pictures. Over to you, Bernard. Thank you, Leslie, for the wonderful introduction. Well, you, you, you put me on very stressful with the way you introduced me, but thank you very much. Uh, hopefully my head now can leave the room because it's just too big. Okay, now, um, thank you very much for joining us, as I said. Uh, thank you for taking time off your busy weekend to, that you usually spend your family to be here with us. Uh, I'm honored to be here, to be invited by the NBC team uh, and the FOB team to present and represent the Auto Working Group, um, a working group which I'm very passionate and, and, and driven to help. Um, yes, so right now I will start. I've been given about 45 minutes max to present and me being quite a chatty person, okay, I am pretty sure I'm going to go past that and, and, and Leslie is going to back in a Bernard uh, last two minutes uh, before you end. Okay, but so um, I, I would appreciate a lot of questions. Send them to Leslie. She'll, she'll go through them and she'll pick up the, 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 the questions that she thinks uh, is most suitable. Uh, and if we don't get a chance to answer all these questions, um, you can message me. Uh, I have two Instagram accounts. Uh, there's Bernard Sia where I post all generally everything except waters. Then I also have another Instagram account uh, called um, Autographer, and you can send me any questions there if you have uh, on otters. Uh, Facebook, I am, you can find me a uh, Bernard Photo Journal. So I've been running this page since uh, early 2016. And how it all started actually with this page was that it wasn't so much for animals, but I was shooting uh, at the 2016 uh, aerial display. Okay, so the Singapore Air Show, and and the pilots were coming in and like, hey, I, I saw your pictures through someone else. Okay, can we have them? Uh, where, do you do you have a, a site that we can uh, view them? So I said, no, I don't. So that triggered me overnight. I, I started this, and then I also started to branch out from um, from military aviation into animals. Okay, um, with that, let me now share my screen. Okay, all right. Um, yes, so I'm a naturalist. I'm a conservationist. I am a wildlife photographer, as uh, Leslie has said. I spend a lot of time volunteering in parks. I, I volunteer with the conservation department 
Uh, if you do want to consider becoming an NFARCS volunteer, if you want to speak to me again, I'm happy to speak to you to, to tell you a bit more about what I can do, what we can do, what you can do uh, for the biodiversity and ecology of Singapore. Okay, uh, I'm also a member of Auto Working Group and I'm also part of the Friends of Parks, uh, the Bulo branch, uh, a member of that particular uh, uh, small group of people that's passionate about um, trying to improve the uh, experience with uh, your visits to certain areas and for me it's Sungai Bulo. All right, so I was approached by NBC um, Leslie's team to say like, you know, hey, Bernard, would you like to do a, a talk on, on auto photography? So I, I thought about it and I was really excited. Uh, I said yes straight away, but I said, could we do something? So in, in ever since the pandemic started, we've seen a phenomenal, okay, this is stratospheric out of the world kind of uh, figures of people wanting to visit our parks our gardens and our reserves, okay? Now, not everybody, not every household would have uh, a, a good pair of binoculars, uh, or should I say a decent pair of binoculars, a decent maybe telescope or scope, we call that shot, uh, or even a good camera with fairly decent zoom, okay? So what's been no what I've been noticing when, when phase two kicked in, um, we had, probably three, four, maybe even five, six, four number of people uh, visiting our different NPAX locations. And everybody has got a mobile phone. Everyone. Okay. Even a, even a, like a 10 year old boy running around the reserve, running around with his handphone, mobile phone. I think there's a brilliant, excellent way for everyone to document what you get when you go out there. Okay. Um, be it coming across an otter, uh, a snake, a crocodile. So I, I realized that I, I didn't want to make this talk about photography 101. Uh, it's a lot of common sense, okay? If you're going to do wildlife photography, you're going to be outdoors. Outdoors means, um, sorry, I didn't mean to mean that you are stupid when I say a lot of common sense, okay? But uh, figuratively speaking, it just takes a little bit of thought and, and preparation. So I'm not going to tell you like, you know, oh, charge your batteries, la, bring this, la, bring that, bring your raincoat in case. No, I'm not going to tell you all that. All those you can go figure out for yourself. I am going to talk about what you should do, how you can improve your shots if you encounter animals, and most importantly, how you can protect the wildlife that we share the world with, okay? Especially when you go to a reserve. A reserve, I see a reserve in Singapore or anywhere in the world as you are entering their domain, you are entering their territory, you are entering their world and you are their guest, okay? so. I'm going to revolve my presentation around that and, and please feel free to, to, to ask questions. Okay, so we'll jump into the uh, first animal and obviously it's going to be um, otters, my, one of my closest to my heart, obviously. Uh, I do help NPARCs with um, quite a few animals, otters, marine turtles or sea turtles, these two, as well as crocodiles, okay? But of course, uh, I'll talk about other animals which I notice that humans come into contact with very regularly, like hornbills. Um, we'll talk about crocodiles as well as snakes. Okay, um, I, I've seen, I've seen people behave, especially around these two animals, uh, behave very ignorantly. I'm not going to say that they were, uh, I'm not going to say that they were foolish, but I'm going to take it as all ignorance, and that maybe this session can educate you all on how you can document them, how you can expect to, or the different scenarios that, you know, as you get to know an animal, you start to understand. And it's very important. I'm not saying that every time you go out, you must go and go through your, your, your Google uh, web search and look for all the animals that you can find. But what I'm saying is, if you can understand the animals that you can possibly chance upon, then you will know what to do, how to react. But, you know, you cannot prepare for everything. Okay, so bottom line is if you don't know this animal that you are seeing or you don't know much about it, best thing is keep your distance, stay back, observe from far, respect the animal. Okay, let's jump into our presentation. What are smooth coated otters? Oh, very interesting, right? Um, in, in my years, so let me tell you how I started wanting to, to, to do wildlife photography. It started in 2011. I said, like, okay, I, I, that's where I jumped into DSLR photography. 
Uh, I've been shooting since the days of the Minolta X700. That was my first camera gift for my mom to me when I was a teenager. And I've always loved photography ever since then. Okay, so it's been about, well, 30 over years. Okay, um, so in, in my last nine years or so, going around looking for wildlife, one of the first animals I wanted to do was look for smooth-coated otters. And it took me one year, one full year of visiting, B, uh, sorry, I was going to, uh, in 2011, I was going to Pasir Ris. I was going to Pasir Ris every weekend or every other weekend for about two hours in the mornings when uh, Gurley would still be asleep. I'll sneak out of the house, I'm not sneak out, I will leave out, I will leave at about seven o'clock. I'll go and spend some time. It took me 20, 30 visits, one year down the road, when I was no longer expecting to see an otter and I was shooting a, a, a stockbill kingfisher was when I saw my first otter and it was September 11, 2012, okay? So what are smooth-coated otters? When, when I'm out on the field, people have called them 101 different names, okay? Uh, they are not rats. People have said, hey, 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 oh, they're red, very big, uh, you know, like, please, it's, they're not rats, okay? Uh, they're not beavers. Even recently, I've heard that, I've heard that so often, even recently, uh, I believe the radio DJs were from 987. They're having a little conversation about otters. And, and one of them said, predators like beavers. It's like, oh my God. Okay, I don't expect you to know everything. Okay, but when you want to start sharing information publicly, I think it is your um, social responsibility to actually share with facts. Okay, if you're not sure, then you should... Uh, you can always put a question at the end of it, like you know, uh, maybe they're like predators, uh, uh, like beavers. Are, are they or, are they predators? Okay, so beavers are uh, they are herbivores. Okay, they feed on the bark of trees, and next thing is beavers are not found in this part of the world. Okay, so they're not beavers. Uh, they've been called seals. No, they're not seals as well. Okay, now they belong to the weasel family, and like their weasel cousins. Badgers, wolverines, which are probably the two most popular or most famous of the lot in the weasel family. Badgers, the honey badgers, you have uh, different sorts of badgers you find around the, uh, the world. Uh, badgers are very uh, resilient, very uh, persistent hunters, okay? Uh, I've seen a documentary where a badger actually was eating a venomous snake. It ate the it, while, while trying to overcome the snake, it had been bitten by the snake so many times. It's a highly venomous snake. Okay, and it finally overcame the snake and it was consuming the snake. Okay, while consuming the snake, it actually, well, I thought it was Sakam. Okay, the, the, the documentary showed the, the, the badger actually eating, 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 slowing down and just stop over. And I thought it died because eventually the, the venom kicked in, right? Uh, very interestingly, the video continued, the documentary continued, and maybe half an hour, an hour later, I'm not sure, can't remember the, the details. The badger got up and continued eating again. The, the first thing it did was like, okay, so it's really, really interesting. All right, Wolverines, obviously, X-Men fans, right? Uh, th that Wolverine, okay, that it actually is a real animal and it belongs to the weasel family as well. And other things I've heard about otters, um, and, and this is just amazing. People out on the streets say things like, oh, Ay, yeah, last time don't have uh, the authors, uh, I tell you, uh, NFAX, la, Chenghu, la, government, la, the zoo, la, you know, formerly AVA also. Oh, there people AVA we introduce this one. Please, again, don't show your ignorance. We are not sure, ask. Okay, so um, smooth coated authors are indigenous to Singapore. In fact, we've got two species of, of authors that are indigenous to Singapore or native to Singapore. Uh, on mainland Singapore, we find a lot of otters. In fact, all the otter sightings are smooth-coated otters. Okay, We have the Asian small clawed otters, which are the world's most sought-after pet trick otter. They are the smallest of the 13 species of otters in the world. Okay, So we have 13 species of otters in the world. Uh, people always talk about otters uh, as a very general thing. All right, uh, People might also see otters and message. Uh, so I'm also part of... Um, the team that, that facilitates the author watch page. Uh, there's a great team of about 10 people uh, who are passionate about authors that run Author City as well. So we get a lot of um, messages and, and the messages comes across to us like, oh, I saw a sea author. 
all right a sea otter doesn't exist in singapore it exists along the coastline the western coastline of northern america all the way up to alaska and down the eastern coastline of russia okay so we don't have sea otters in singapore we have smooth coated otters or if you're lucky enough smooth coated otters are also found in pulau takong and pulau ubin but if you're lucky enough you go to pulau ubin pulau takong you might also see the asian small clot it doesn't mean and i've seen this post like a week ago 10 days ago there was a lady oh i went to pulau ubin and lo and behold i saw otters i'm so privileged because i saw asian small clot otters and they're found on pulau ubin and then i look at the video the footage uh actually it's a uh, smooth coated otter sorry to um end your happiness all right but again yes ask us okay you can ask you can always write to NPARKS, ask us for, for, for details. You can always send a message to me on my Facebook page, write to Author Watch, write to Author City. We are all together in this community to help. All right. Um, yes. So let's let's move on. Let's start. Okay. Um, photography. If you have the in photography, you have different focal lengths. All right. For different families, uh, have got different tolerance of human presence. Okay, so some more, some are very, some are extremely habituated to, to otters. Uh, I'd say case in point, best, best analogy is the Bishan family. When they started dating, when mom and dad started dating, they were already like, you know, uh, maybe 10 to 20 followers in the evenings around Bishan Park on a weekday. Uh, weekends, you might see like, you know, anywhere up to about 50 people following them. And then when they had babies in Bishan Park, three babies, so two dad and mom and the three babies running around the cute little babies all right oh, i think the numbers just okay, went up again so the bishan family has been very very uh habituated to humans because humans kept looking for them okay so the family is amazing so if you are looking for now uh, this is about photography uh, not so much the background okay of, of the animal but if you're looking for the bishan family you know that's the bishan family uh, because they don't mind running near you. I'm not saying that you should run towards them. There's a lot of difference there when the animal runs near you and you running near the animal, okay? A lot of difference there. So when the animals are, are fairly close to you and if you bring a very long lens, these are the kind of shots you're going to get, okay? Which is, to me, uh, it, it's nice to see them grooming each other, but I, I, can't sh I can't take one picture, all right, with the head and the tail in that one frame because I, I may have gone out with the wrong camera, wrong lens. Okay, not wrong camera, but wrong lens. Okay, so otters are very affectionate. Uh, Smooth-coated otters and uh, our Asian small clot otters are very social. They stay around as a family. It could be multiple. Uh, we don't call it generations, but it's the first generation with the mom and dad. Then subsequently, you have multiple litters. So you could have litter number one helping to look after litter number two. And then when litter number two grows up and is about the same size as litter number one, and they're all about the same size and litter number three comes, maybe litter number one starts to disperse. And then you have litter number, uh, a part of litter number one, part of litter number two, helping to look after um, litter number three. All right. So that practice in the animal kingdom is known as cooperative breeding. Okay. So cooperative breeding is, is seen uh, practice amongst uh, not all authors, okay, not all authors, only in a few, and both of them are author species, that is, found in Singapore. So you've got your Asian small clots that does that. We also have your uh, smooth-coated otters, okay? So they're very social. They're always taking care of each other. They're very tightly knit family. But I did mention dispersal just now. So I'll talk about this uh, because we also get the community, uh, Otter Watch, Otter City, and, uh, and Parks, Acres as well. Acres is doing a wonderful job. Thank you, Acres. Okay, so we get a lot of feedback. Oh, there's a lone author. The lone author is all alone. Um, can you please send someone to go and catch it and 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 do something with it? Then we're like, what's the lone author doing? Tell us. Oh, it's eating. It's swimming around. It's eating. It's swimming around. It's playing. It came up to defecate. Okay, so so there's a special word for otters when otters go and poo poo. The word is called, the author is sprinting. Sprinting is spelled S-P-R-A-I-N-T, sprint. So um, the author, the lone author is eating, the author is playing, uh, it's, uh, it's messing around, it's sprinting. Okay, so we go like, so what's the problem? Uh, because it is not with the family. Then we go like, it's normal. Um, we, not every author 
needs to be with his family. So that's not I mentioned dispersal. An author, when it reaches average age of two to three years, it will start to leave, it will start to um, find its own family, find its own territory, and then, you know, find its, okay, find its own territory, find its own mate, and then start its family, okay? So that's how when we come across a lone author, we don't need to get um, uh, too reactive, observe it, we'll see if it's eating. If it's eating, it's a very good sign. It means it knows how to catch fish already, okay? Um, is it mobile? Is it swimming? If it's swimming, again, yes. Uh, but if you see an author that has got like what you think is a broken leg, dragging one foot, okay? You see an author with uh, something choking it, right? Then you want to call, you want to send a message to, again, all the same people that I mentioned, okay? Um, may, maybe this is this is a last minute uh, add-on. Uh, I'm not sure if, 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 if Leslie has already prepared this. Uh, so we've been working very hard preparing for this talk. Um, th there are numbers that we can share with you. If we've not prepared it, I'm sure we can share it with you down the road uh, that you can call uh, N Parks or Acres. Call N Parks and then, you know, um, Acres is really busy with 101 things. So is N Parks, don't get me wrong, okay? But you can call, the, call them and they will inform the author working group and we will send our volunteers down to observe. So if you think a particular author is in distress, okay? If it's eating, it's swimming, it, it's, and, and you think that the, the distress factor is because it's alone, please don't call us. It is fine, okay? If you see that it's not eating, it is very skinny, it is, it is dragging its leg, there's something around the body, around the torso that is cutting it up, there's a big hook sticking out of the mouth, okay? Or even a small hook, any hook, okay? Um, this is when you want to call us, okay? Now, um, this is a very commonly seen sight if you follow authors. Uh, authors eating orange fish. All right, the first thing people will say, oh, they're eating koi. They're eating koi. Not all orange fish are koi. Okay? All right, so you have other examples. You could be a tilapia. In this particular instance, uh, humans have introduced this species of authors, or, or, sorry, of fish into our environment. They are not native to Singapore. They're not even native to Asia. This, these are Midas cichlids, which come from the ornamental fish pet trade. Okay. Uh, this, this particular fish comes, I believe, as an NUS paper on it. Sorry, I cannot acknowledge the person that wrote, wrote, wrote on this. Uh, but I do remember that I think the researchers found that the Midas cichlid actually comes in 12 different color combinations. But because the all orange one really stands out, we're all like, whoa, okay. So yes, um, remember, they are introduced by humans, not naturally found in Singapore, okay? And the authors are doing us a favor by eating them, okay? So we talk about food. I, I'll, I will touch on people always having that comment. Um, hey, uh, author, eat the head, uh, then leave the, the, the fish, the rest of the fish behind and then walk away and eat another fish with the, just the head alone. So this kind of comments, um, we, we cannot base our comments and share them publicly on, like, lack of a better word, shallow observations, okay? Number one, I bet a lot of you didn't know that these were introduced. And this, these fish, cichlids are, are terribly, uh, Evasive, all right. They will, they will invasive. Okay, they will come and they will take over the the world, if you will. All right. So when I first started documenting uh, the authors, I would occasionally see one of the locally found fish that humans eat. The Chinese eat it. The the, the locals eat it. Okay, I, I'm sure you all know the word sunhok. Okay, a sunhok is a very slow growing fish. Okay, sunhoks are also known as in English a marble goby. Now, sunhawks are expensive when you see them in restaurants. It's because they are really very slow-growing fish. They're ambush hunters. They don't, they don't swim like these kind of fish that you see in the, in, in the screen. Right? Sunhawks are basically ambush predators. They just wait. They get a fish, come by, they pop, they attack it, and then they eat. Okay, then they grow a little bit. All right? It doesn't happen for another one week. They don't do anything. They just chill. Okay? So I, have, I used to see sunhawks being caught by authors very rarely in, in 2016, 2017. Today, talk about in the last 
the last time I saw an author catch a soon hawk, okay, I, I cannot remember one in the last two years. Okay, so all these non-native fish that have been introduced selfishly by humans is now taking over the world. Okay, and all our local diversity, our sorry, biodiversity, our old, all our local wildlife is, is slowly disappearing. So actually, I'm very happy that the authors are eating uh, such fish. Now, I'll, I'll talk about the head part now, eating our heads and leaving it. Uh, we cannot be hypocritical. We, meaning me as well. When I go, when you go to a buffet, when you go to a line of buffet where you have like, wow, 30 dishes, 40 dishes, okay? And then you like, don't know where to start, right? When you don't know where to start, brings me to two things, okay? It's about pawns as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, let's talk about the buffet line itself, the food. If you talk about artists and, and you present it with a lot of uh, food, humans do it. I will like, okay, this, 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 this. I'm not going to eat fried rice. I'm not going to eat rice, okay? I'm not going to eat chicken rice. Why will I eat that? I want to go, oh, lobster. Main lobsters. Yesterday was World Lobster Day, incidentally, right? Okay, so, wow, main lobsters. Oh, I sure want to eat, lah, right? And then I go have my first lobster. Have my second lobster. Have my third lobster. And then I'm like, wow, oh, making my money's worth, right? So I try another dish. I go on and move on to say some kind of uh, cod fish. I, I take a small portion, I'm enjoying it, okay? And then I try other dishes. And then I, I, I yeah, my favorite is still lobster. Lah, huh? So I go to a lobster, I have a fourth lobster. And I feel I'm so stuffed, okay? That I think I should try other things because I haven't tried another 90% of all the other dishes available. But what, what I do is I maybe leave a little bit of the lobster tail here. And I go in. So we do it. I'm sure you do it. I mean, we, we cannot be hypocritical as humans practice, like, you know, not finishing their food because there is more food on the table. We cannot fault the authors for doing so. Okay. So uh, my other point about pawns. Now, when you put, so humans have, now this, is, this was wonderfully um, told by uh, the author man, Siva Soti in Singapore to, when he had an interview with a radio station. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful explanation. Humans have pawns. Why? We want to showcase. We want to show off that we've got fish, wonderful looking fish in a pond. So in, in the real world, in the water body, there are little crevices, there are little areas that, that fish can run from predators to hide. Okay? It's natural. Now, you create a pond. When you create a pond, the first thing you want to do is show the people that you know show yourself show your family show your visitors to your house that i've got a nice pond here and i've got a nice looking fish okay you may have one little part of the pond that goes under a structure and you call that okay they are little sanctuary they can hide there but along comes a predator and the predator can jump into the water it's not like you standing up there on dry land looking down the predator can jump into the water and the predator is taking advantage of what you, the owner of the pond, has done. What you have done is you have put fish into a barrel, you've given a shotgun to a fellow human being and, hey, try and shoot a fish. I guarantee you every shot you're going to take, you're going to probably hit a fish if you put fish in a barrel that way, okay? So you need to understand otters, okay? And, and that when you change the natural perspective of things, um, for your advantage, there's always two sides of a coin. There's always a disadvantage as well. Okay? So, in, in the case of um, uh, Jezreel, where she had her Ahwat, her arowana, uh, taken out from her pond, I, I feel for her. Okay? But the author is not as intelligent as humans. We, with such high IQ, the most intelligent animal in the world, okay, want to talk down and look down and criticize animals that are not as intelligent as us. I think it's absolutely not fair, okay? So when the author comes to a pond, okay, and, and Jezreel has, has been very understanding about it, thank you very much, okay? Uh, but let me just elaborate for those of you who don't understand yet, that when an author comes out to a pond, it doesn't know head or tail or what it is. This is a water body to me. This is a buffet spread to me. This is... A chance for me to eat to my heart's content because 
I, as an author, I don't know the words ornamental fish different from a wild fish in a reservoir or in a river. Okay, you, you see that? Okay, so, so, so authors, when they end up eating fish from a pond, from uh, a, a private estate, they don't know your private estate is a private estate. To them, it's part of their land. Okay, it's part of their territory. It's part of my world as well. So we go down criticizing authors. We really have to um, take a step back and remember just one thing. We share the world with animals. We are not the only animal in the world. We are homo, we are called homo, uh, homo sapiens. Okay, so we are homo sapiens. We are just one of the many, many, many animals that's found in animal kingdom. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I, I, I am running. Well, okay. Leslie's is going to message me anytime now. Uh, okay, so let's talk about authors. Authors are, are, are very social. Authors love to do things together. And, and what you're seeing here is, is a very interesting picture. This is Singapore Marathon, okay? Standard Chartered Marathon. This is an event where people, it's an international event. Marathoners have actually stopped. You can see the track, okay? Between the two sets of barriers is actually the actual track. Uh, there were people who were stopping, getting out of the track, and people will continue running. But what it is, is that they are actually so thrilled. Majority of the people that we meet uh, out and out when we are out shooting authors and documenting authors, love authors or just amuse with authors, okay? Um, given that the three ladies all have a mobile phone each, um, is, is brings me to my next point, okay? About behavior. So when you are out and you see authors, it is good to document authors from a low angle. Okay, just let me share that with you because a low angle actually gives a different perspective. I will actually show you an example of pictures later. Uh, but the, the picture here shows you three ladies with, three, with a handphone each. This is 100% of observers with a mobile phone or a certain camera in hand. So it brings me to another point. And this point is people will always say, Ayo, I tell you, ah, uh, uh, Bernard, you love authors or not? I got friends who, who actually messaged me, uh, Bernard, you love authors. Why? They are becoming pests. I said, can I ask you one question? Okay, just one question first before I continue explaining to you. Have you ever seen an author? No, never. Now, what are you talking about? All right, everybody's got a mobile phone. Social media is so powerful. Okay, there could be one author family here in maybe a uh, six kilometer radius the nearest author could be six kilometers away could be a single author and no one knows about it okay in this particular area one author family in the 30 minutes that it was rolling around the sand drying off okay maybe 300 people came on and shared it on social media all right or you know whatsapp your friends lah, you know and, and it goes viral right so authors cannot be considered pests in my uh, background uh, of understanding wildlife. All right, we, we have less, we have only about 90 authors. Okay, 90 authors in Singapore. Singapore has 5.5 million humans and we have nine zero authors. Not nine zero families, uh, nine zero authors. And you call them a pest just because you see them on social media. I think, again, we need to take a step back and not be hypocritical, okay? Um, yes, Let, let's, let's move on. Okay, some of you might wonder, hey, what's the author doing? Why do they do that? Huh? Okay, so I'll also bring another point. All right, uh, there are people who go like, uh, author on land. Author is, the author, we saw this author running across uh, a field. Authors need land as much as they need water. No, in fact, I'll correct myself. If you gave an author, let's say you were a zoo, okay? And if you had to house your author for a few days because they say, example, a, a leak, not the Singapore Zoo, it's any zoo, okay? Uh, let's say there's a leak in the pond that you've created for the author, so you need to do some emergency works. And, and you're putting the authors out in, say, a dry enclosure for three, four days. If you put the authors in there and you give them water to drink and you give them fish to eat, okay, they can survive in that dry enclosure for as long as you want to keep them in there, okay? But you cannot put the author into a pool, and keep them in there for more than several hours because they will eventually get exhausted of swimming without access to land and they will drown and die. You see the difference there? So 
otters on land is something natural as well. So don't call acres, don't call ant parks, don't don't write to Otter Watch, don't write to Otter City and say to them, hey, look here, we need to take care of this otter. And we ask why? Oh, because it's sleeping on land. Sea otters don't sleep on land. Yes, you are right. Sea otters don't need land for weeks on end. Okay? But we don't have sea otters in Singapore. All right? Okay, let's move on. Uh, cooperative breeding to cooperative hunting. This is simply amazing. They're, they're intelligent animals, but not half as intelligent as Singaporean. Uh, sorry, as humans, beg your pardon, all right, as us humans. Now, uh, our, our otters here are seeing corralling fish, a school of fish, into the shallows of, uh, of this is Sungai Tampanese, okay? So they're quite intelligent. If you see on the right side, or the left side of the screen, I beg your pardon, left side, uh, you will notice that Almost all the otters on the left side of the screen have their heads just above the water or partially in the water. This family has learned to, because it's a fairly large family, they cannot have all side by side to corral the fish. They have the front row and they have the back row. All right, so the front row are pushing the fish into the shallow and they have their heads down because the fish might swim towards them. Okay, and then the back row of otters just keeps their head higher up because they are fish that will swim towards the front row, see the front row otters because behind is a really dry area, jump over the otters in the front row and into my mouth, which is exactly what's happening here. So they are very skillful hunters. They hunt very well, which brings me to another point. Do not ever feed our wildlife. Don't like, oh, you're so poor thing. Uh. I saw the otter. Uh. It looks like it's got nothing to eat. Because you saw it on land, it's not hunting. Our smooth-coated otters, okay, they take almost 100% of their meal is fish, okay? I mean, you, you occasionally get um, a, them eating like maybe uh, a frog, all right? There are people who introduce blue frogs for religious uh, reasons, and, and I've seen otters um, investigating this uh this person does that once a week in a certain location I, i'm not going to divulge where i'm just going to just share with this with you uh so once a week he'll release catfish and he will release um american bullfrogs the authors have obviously catfish being a fish they eat okay happy right uh, but they have grown to check out the they've grown from checking out the american bullfrogs all right to starting to eat them because the first few times when this guy, when I noticed this guy uh, releasing the American bullfrogs, the authors would go by and like, hmm, what's this? Uh? You know, and then turn around, walk away and swim away. Uh. Um, fast forward two, three weeks, they're like, wow, quite nice. Uh. Hey, we all humans also eat the same bullfrogs, okay? The American bullfrogs are what we eat in our, okay, uh, frog porridge. So same thing. So the authors also kind of like, you know, figured out that, hey, it's food. So authors will also eat crustaceans like uh, or giant oriental river prawns, so on and so forth, okay? Mm. Now, behavior, when you're out photographing or uh, doing photography with, and you encounter authors, you, you need to know how comfortable they are around you and, and you need to notice. You cannot take a step forward even if you're 50 meters away and then notice that they're looking at you and running away from you, and then you chase, all right? That is absolutely unethical. It's not the way you should be, be documenting wildlife. Um, I got a very interesting slide later, which I, again, I, I'm very blessed being part of the auto working group, being an NFARCS volunteer to have had uh, many opportunities to, to learn from world experts. And I'll share with you um, some facts a little bit later on, okay? Now, moving on um, let's, uh, to, to this particular picture is that if, if you are approaching slowly and surely and, you not, and they're not noticing you, you know, one got up to groom, the rest, the other seven are like, you know, uh, still sleeping, then, then you're all right. But it doesn't mean, okay, again, it doesn't mean that even if you are like within three, four meters of the author, you keep pushing it to go to a uh, handphone mobile phone distance okay uh, I, I will keep mentioning this in my presentation you cannot take a mobile phone as an opportunity to photograph an animal 
with the same standards of those that use a ten thousand dollar setup uh you know but i'm going to tell you that you know you don't really have to buy uh, spend ten twenty thousand dollars on camera equipment for you to get close up from a distance uh, i'll talk to that in a while about that in a while sorry and uh hopefully i have enough time whoa okay so um let, let's move on I'm, I'm just gonna skip uh some of the slides i still have four more animals to talk about um this is this is authors being curious okay um, this is a Sungai Bulo Nature Reserve. There was a relatively small croc. I would say the croc is about the size of the otter, just over a meter. Uh, it was floating there. The otters were playing nearby, and being otters, they would go around, they investigate things. And the otter on the right here actually saw the croc first. And so the otter here was looking at the croc. The croc uh, before this was 180 degrees around, floating, doing nothing. Then the author on the left noticed what the author on the right was doing. It, it came by and it went out closer and closer and closer. And the, the snouts of both the author on the left and the crocodile, I think was less than like six inches apart when the crocodile felt that, okay, you are too close for my comfort. It, it turned around, it bolted and it swam away. Hence, this picture was, how this picture was uh, taken. Okay, um, you, you need to understand that in the world of predators and again beavers are not predators okay predators are animals that that go out there and and eat other animals if you will okay so in the world of apex predators they will want to let each other know okay that hey i'm here i'm around uh, this is my territory get off get out okay so these four otters at sungai bulo this was taken at the main bridge uh, came across a basking crocodile the crocodile obviously is, if you ask me, is more of an apex predator than the otter, lah, okay? And then you will say like, oh, we have uh, heard of otters killing crocodiles. And then you show me the footage, right? Yeah, people send me like, you know, number one, it's not local otters. It's not smooth coated otters. Those are giant otters. Giant otters grew up to about 1.8 meters long. Number two, that's a caiman, not a crocodile. There are six species of caimans found in the territory of the uh, of the giant otter, and majority of these uh, caimans don't grow beyond three meters. Most of them are be between two and a half to three meters. So if you talk about a family of six, seven giant otters taking on a crocodilian, uh, that's the generic name for all the different uh, types of crocodiles, uh, taking on a crocodilian is slightly longer than them. Obviously, they're going to overpower the crocodilian eventually, right? So you're looking at like six adults, 1.8 meters long, and they are trying to uh, take on a, 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 a caiman. Why? Again, remember, when you have babies, you are protective. Humans are too. If you had a baby on a, on a, on a pram, I'm stranger. I walk up to your baby. Your baby is so cute. And then I saw your baby maybe, say, biting, biting a toy. Lah, okay. And then I go in Kepo. I walk up to the baby and like, hey, I use my fingers and grab the toy. Don't bite this. And you are okay with them biting it. Okay, or the baby biting it. And I did that. I'm sure you'd be furious. Like, like who, the, who are you? What are you doing? I'm their parent. Let me do. So again, when babies are involved, any animal will become protective. All right? So don't provoke them. So when the caiman in that particular video, and I know the doctor, and I know the person that documented this footage of the caiman being killed by the giant river otters. His name is uh, Charlie Hamilton James. Okay, he's an excellent, he's, he's an otter lover. He, he has discovered a lot of things about otters. He is a producer, otter researcher. Uh, he's even discovered that otters can smell underwater. Okay, this is really amazing. How do you smell underwater? Blow a bubble. And then when this bubble comes into contact with the surface of the water around the bubble, quickly inhale this bubble back again and you get a sense of the surrounding okay that's really really amazing so anyway so so remember that when when you start sharing things about authors doing this authors doing that authors are and this kind of sharing usually come of people who think that they are a pest okay it's very hypocritical okay and when i ask these people will call them the pest have you seen an author in your life never okay almost almost all of them say never okay so if those who have seen an author and call them a pest Maybe uh, they came to my house and they ate my fish. And I, I feel for you. Okay, I feel for you. And, and, and to me, if I, if I had fish 
that I kept for even two weeks and they ate my fish, uh, I'll be irritated and I'll be angry. But uh, obviously, I'll overcome it after a while. Okay, and I'm sure Jazreel was angry at the first, at the very beginning, and she overcome it and she thought through it, and 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 that was a perfect example of of how you can stop for a while, look at the bigger picture, breathe, and then proceed on with your actions. Okay. Uh, so talking about back to photography, if if you like low angles, low angles is the best. If I had shot this from two meters up, I would the background would be water and the water would be very sort of clear. Uh, and, and now when I lower my camera down to the, to the height of the author, so one of the best things to do is to try to be the same eye level as your subject. If you're shooting a bird, if you're shooting uh, an author, you're shooting a, even a domestic, your, your, your cat, okay? Instead of shooting from above, like you may always do from up angle, try go down low against uh, uh, just above the floor, okay? This is what you get. You get a lot of, you, uh, the background is blur, what we call depth of field, all right? So the depth of field here is very, very uh, interesting where I, I don't have anything cluttering the picture except for the adult author, uh, the Midas cichlid, and a baby trying to help itself to the fish. And actually in this picture, what happened a moment before this was that the, the adult author was actually as low as the baby author. But because it wasn't ready to share the food yet, okay, they're a bit selfish in that way. It's it's the same thing, all right? It's, it's, it's the same thing when you go out on an airplane, when you are listening to the announcements on in case of emergency, what to do. They always tell you to take care of yourself before you take care of your ward, your children, you know? It's the same thing. They, you got to take care of yourself before you can take care of, other, uh, of, of others. So in this case, the adults sometimes need to eat first before they move on to take care of the young. All right, and besides the young also has milk uh, for the first uh, first several months, uh, first few months and not several months. Okay, so otter babies are born blind. In the first four weeks, they do nothing but just wiggle around and drink mother's milk. Uh, when the eyes open, that's when the curiosity in otters come. Uh, week five, week six, they're probably still going to be learning to swim uh, and drinking milk. Uh, they may get uh, acquainted to fish. But week five, week six, they likely will show little or no interest in the fish because they just want to check out the environment. They're happy to go and swim, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, then, then with the constant exposure to fish, they will slowly learn to appreciate and want to eat fish. Okay, um, what we are doing right now is, um, sorry, let's check out my time. Yeah, if I could just pause you right there, yes, yes, Bernard, yes, yes. just um, bear in mind the time. If we aren't able to go through all the animals that you want to show us today, yes. maybe we can think about maybe a, another platform. Okay, sure, but this sure. is great. Watch the time. We'd love to see more animals that you have shot. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Leslie. Okay, so yes, uh, photography bit. Um, we are, we're talking about uh, having having the the angles, all right? Um, yes, so you'll see a lot of cute pictures like, wow, where did we get this picture, Bernard? Why, why was it doing this? In, in all... I, I could say like, you know, oh, this is home alone, you know, uh, where he's like doing that. Uh, someone said that to me. I said, okay, so basically what the author was doing is after eating, it was just grooming itself. All right. So having your camera ready for all kinds of different shots, very important. Okay. So in, in this instance, uh, I was on a bridge. The, this was uh, just by the mangrove area on the bridge at uh, Sungai, Sungai Tampanese in Pasir Ris. And the, the author had already finished eating his fish and it was grooming itself. And I was taking different shots of the author doing funny things. This, so so different different angles. All right. So this again, what the author was telling me, time out. Uh, no more photography. No, I, I don't know what he was doing, but I caught the moment and it's interesting. And I interpreted as time out. You know, which uh, Leslie is trying to tell me right now. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Um, so yes, delighting you always. As I said earlier on, I'll say it again. If the author wants to approach you, I'm at least five meters away from the entire family. So I'm, I'm standing there. I'm sitting down, actually. I'm not standing. I'm sitting down. My legs are crossed. My legs are stretched out. I have my long lens. Because the long lens is so long, I cannot take the meters, uh, the, the, the author's five meters, six meters away. I am actually using my handphone. And this guy slowly but surely, I think it took like two or three minutes to, to come by. He was very intrigued with my long lens and that big little hole there. That it came up to me and and all i could do even though i've got a 
so this is a thirteen thousand dollar lens. Okay, I, I've got like all the camera equipment in the world, but I couldn't shoot with it. I could use only my my mobile phone. Okay, um, I, I took this in December twenty eighteen. It was quite amazing. Again, uh, if you haven't heard the story, was um, it's it's all the un unexpected. I wanted this couple to reenact a proposal that they had done just a few minutes before, and what what. What, what the angle was, I wanted the otters in the background swimming along the water's edge. They are, the water's edge is to the right, maybe about four or five meters away. Yeah, okay. So, and, and what happened was the family was swimming by. I was getting ready to shoot from a different angle. Um, the couple proposing and then the otters swimming away. But one otter decided to come towards the family, the, this couple, sorry, and call the family members. So it's quick to make a noise. And, 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 and next thing I know, it's like, there are four or five otters around them. And this one shot looked very funny. Yeah. Basically, three otters are looking at a couple like, you know, what are they doing? Okay. So photography, unexpected. Okay. Very important. Always be prepared for the unexpected. Okay. Uh, if you get to know the, the animals well enough, the couple behind is very far away. They are approximately eight to nine meters away from, from again, it's the camera angle. Okay. They are, the, the, I knew that the family was going to cross this area. I, I told uh, this couple of couple of good friends of mine, uh, hey, come, let's do a, since you all both love otters so much, let me do a wedding shoot for you as, as, uh, as for fun uh, and as, as, as wedding gift to, from me to you. Uh. All right. So the otters came by and they're going to cross the path. I got them to sit far away from me. I, I am probably also, because I'm using a long lens, all right. So I'm maybe about over 10 meters away from the otters. Uh, the couple is almost 10 meters away from the otters. And this is what I can, uh, this is what I got. Okay. Uh, in, interestingly enough, uh, this was also, uh, uh, well, this, this, well, he's you, still young, lah, by my, co comparison to me. This is an uh, author researcher. He was doing his, uh, his honors with NUS. And uh, what happened was we managed to take his graduation photos with the subject that gave him, he's got him an honors. Okay, um, I will, yes, Leslie, I hear you. She's texting me, telling me to wrap up soon. Okay, um, so authors, when you photograph them, you, you will come across occasions when they're actually uh, very busy doing all kinds of stuff, playing, eating, and of course, pooping. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, let me share with you how you differentiate a male and female author. Okay, so through a camera, through a good lens, you can shoot and you can differentiate a uh, uh, male and female. So look at these two pictures. I need to go slower because it's lagged on, sorry. Okay, so this first picture, you will notice that the P is actually flowing backwards, okay? So it's, it's kind of, it's backwards. It's not parallel to the, to the spring coming out of, of the butt, okay? So this one you can see is parallel. So the question here is, is this male or female? Okay, so when the P comes backwards this way, this is a male author. Okay, this is one very clear way of, of def differentiating uh, a, a male from a female. So again, when females P, you will see that there's a flow of their P, it falls straight down parallel to their, uh, def uh, to their, to their sprint. Okay, um, now when you are a predator, most predators have a way of marking territory. So out of their butt also comes out when they are defecating, comes out of gel. And this is actually a scent gland, from a scent gland. It looks like this. I, I say it looks like honey, but it is actually what makes it very strong smelling uh, in, terms of, in terms of what you actually smell at a spring site. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video. This is a video of how I would describe an author. So this, what we call a poop dance, you will see this particular author here, the one nearest the camera, actually doing a poop dance. Uh, what he is doing is he is actually trying to spread his sprint by moving around and it looks like a dance, okay? And then later on, after he's done that, he turns around and he starts what I call spreading butter and kaya on your toast, okay? He uses his tail and he spreads his scent, okay? So just enjoy this little video. So here's the poop dance. So he's actually pooping. He's defecating right now. He's spraying thing. You can see it falling out. Okay. And then he's actually going to spread it. And then he goes, turns around, and he comes back, and he starts to spread his scent 
in the area, marking territories, which what predators always do. Okay, um, N Parks has got all these do's and don'ts. All right, if you actually go and search uh, N Parks Animal Encounters do's and don'ts, you will find a whole long list. This is what uh, you can find on otters. I believe someone in the team is now sharing a link with you all. Okay, so I won't dwell on this. I, I'm, I'm going to show you again when you are out photographing um, otters. Always bear in mind that you should keep your distance. As, as, as uniform as this may seem. Oh, someone goes near. I also can go near, lah, you know. So monkey see, monkey do. Humans are the biggest monkeys in the world. Lah. Okay, so um, what happens is, well, maybe minus the gorillas. Okay, but anyway, uh, when I said, I was being sarcastic. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so um, the, the many a time, okay, so this particular location was the site of a otter nip. An otter had nipped a person at this particular site, okay? Um, when people are around and, and if you are one of those in the crowd, okay, and someone says to you, can you please stand back, take one step back, listen to them. People know, may, may be more knowledgeable than you are. Don't because you only have a mobile phone, you want to go near, I go near and I take my picture. All right? You, you will antagonize, you will provoke the animal. Okay? And when an animal nips you, it's telling you, stay back. Okay? When an animal attacks you, it's different. Huh? A nip is to bite you and run away. Okay? Like tell you, stay back. Okay? When an animal attacks you, it will be attacking you repeatedly biting. Okay? So, so yes. So this was a site of one of the nips that happened in Singapore. And this was exactly how close people were to the otters. And... To make the difference, to change the dynamics of the situation that you see in this photograph, the otter family back then when the person got nipped had otter babies. Okay, so the babies were being uh, protected and you are too close to me. All right, this is an international panel of researchers that study otters that were in Singapore. Uh, again, I was very privileged to be part, to attend, to attend this session. See the difference here? This is how international author researchers and scientists observe authors. I'll go back to the other picture again. This is your local... A. I want to take a picture of authors. Okay? This is world-renowned researchers. Some of them have spent 30 years studying authors. Okay? And yet they stand so far away to actually observe the authors. So do you all see the difference here? How you should behave? when you're out uh, doing your photography of authors or any wildlife for that matter, okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the points, okay, that is on the advisory for authors is to keep your dog on a tight leash. Now, again, we chance upon dogs regularly. Some dogs are very yelpy, you know. Some dogs are very calm and collected, okay? Very well trained uh, by the owners. So in this case here, this dog, a golden retriever, very well trained. The dog, the owners know how to keep the lead, the dog on a tight leash, even though it's well behaved. It didn't bother the author at all. The author may have his head a bit lower, which could be a sign of like you know, um, a little bit of anxiety. Okay, could be, but the author never ever approached the dog. They, it was a, a wonderful moment for me to take a picture. Okay, uh, I really don't have time to talk about the different animals. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about um, photography again. Of authors, uh, but this is very interesting. Where I want you to know that if you behave correctly around animals, they won't even bother about you. Okay, so the authors are all here rolling about in Sungai Bulo, and there is no one that's close to them. The closest is this lady, and she is not noisy. She was actually trying to call her husband over, um, but the, the husband just decided to stay there. You can't see him right now. Okay, um, but she was not shouting like, hey, come over, come over. She tried to gesture him to come over, but he just decided to stay. So this couple had a wonderful uh, perception of, of uh, being responsible and being ethical around wildlife. The authors didn't bother about the couple, neither did they ever bother about me. They just went about doing their stuff. Okay, um, right. All right, I, I don't think I've got time for, to touch on hornbills. I, as I said uh, earlier on, I have got a lot of things to talk about, but I'll, 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 I'll fast forward, okay? Um, use an appropriate camera for the different genres of photography. Uh, not having the appropriate camera does not give you the right, okay, to provoke wildlife, thus endangering the humans around you. When I say this, I'll, I'll give you an example, 
Okay, Th there was once when I saw a group of photographers, all right, um, flanking a family of otters, one left, one right. And then they were coming through this group, which was fine, okay? And then somebody decided to, uh, what in local terms you call gay tiang, uh, somebody tried to be smart and tried to, to run in front of the otters to actually take a picture of them. So what the person just did was, was actually boxing in the otters. So we have one group on the left, one group on the right, the otters have got back in front to, of themselves to actually uh, move. Uh. And then now there's somebody in front of them as well. So we just boxed in the author. When I say we, is collectively as, 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 as humans, uh, okay? And then the authors were, were not happy and they had babies as well. What they did was they started to charge, okay? And, and fortunately enough, people all ran and, and they managed to. But, but don't, don't do things and for, for, the, for selfish reasons. Never ever think, okay, that if you don't have that shot, you want to get it, you have to do it at the right time, right place. Uh, right time could be when there are less people, uh, you're the only person, okay? Uh, right place is, obviously, don't do this over the weekend because there's not people around you, okay? Monkey see, monkey do again, all right? Um, phone cameras are great for document. I've said that just now, I'll say it again. Phone cameras are excellent for you to document while your, 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 your journey into a park, into a reserve or into a gardens, but it is not the ideal form of a camera to document wildlife. Okay, um, you can get a point of shoot for a fraction of the price. You, you may be, okay, so I'm going to show you a few examples here. Yeah, okay. So this is photography and ethics. Now, this particular picture here is taken with a $2,000 mobile phone. Wow, amazing. Very nice, right? But when I want to focus, there's actually a crocodile here. This is a crocodile, okay? So people who are not trained to, un to, to know what a crocodile looks like will look at this and say like, uh... No, leh. I, I, I thought during my volunteer, I said like, you know, that's a crocodile. My volunteer session, that's a crocodile. No, lah, it looks like a... Where, where? That one looks like a, a lock, lah, a stick. Lah. Okay, that's a crocodile. So, with the same $2,000 phone, I try to go maximum zoom. This is what I get. Okay, lah, it looks like a crocodile. I can see the tail. Lah. But if you've never seen a crocodile, you don't know that that's a crocodile. Again, you'll say, no, lah, that's a stick. Lah. Okay? So, this is a, the standard of a $2,000 uh, smartphone. Okay? For a fraction of the price, okay, this camera here, which is very small, you all probably cannot see that, huh? but this little point and shoot camera has got 40 times zoom, okay, 40 times zoom took this, all right, so I took this, this little $500 camera could take wide angle and it could zoom in to take this, so again, if you don't want to spend ten, twenty thousand dollars, or even five thousand dollars on 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 fairly decent camera equipment to 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 lug around, and you can buy a point and shoot. This was taken with a five hundred dollar camera, okay, and it's also an older model, mind you, yeah, it's an older model, and and I could take that kind of a distance, forty times zoom, which is equivalent of your uh, experienced photographer, which is almost one thousand mm, okay, and this again is only a five hundred dollar point and shoot. This again is my thousand, a two thousand uh, dollar smartphone, um, maximum zoom, mangrove pit viper. I'm standing at the same spot because I decided to use my long lens, which has a minimum focus distance of two point seven meters. So I'll show you the difference here. Okay, so this is uh, my two thousand dollar smartphone, ten times zoom, maximum zoom already. This is the five hundred dollar forty times zoom camera. Okay. This is that 40 times zoom camera cropped further on a computer, which is very decent. This is a snake. This is a mangrove pit viper. Now, if you had a $13,000 lens, like I showed you earlier on, this is what you could do, okay? Again, depending on what you want to do, if you ask me, this is more than enough for a $500 point and shoot camera, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, um, with that, I'm just going to end off with this particular, uh, well, is it, yeah, it's, it's, it's my last slide. Okay, now this is a NPAX updated uh, advisory that came out on the 1st of June, as you can see, okay, below the Wildlife Act, okay, 1st of June. If you are out there, please do not feed animals, okay? If you think that the author looks, 
in distress, give us a call. If you think the author looks skinny, give us a call. Okay, give Enfax, give Acres, uh, Drop Author Watch, Author City a message. We'll be happy to take over and, and look into this. Okay, feeding animals is disastrous. Look at the maquettes and how it, it has uh, been hated by some people and loved by others, okay? Macaques in Singapore are feared by people because they actually charge at people, grab plastic bag. They have been conditioned to know that the sound of the raffling plastic bag is possibly food. How did it start? Again, decades ago, humans started to give, oh, so poor thing, uh, okay, I shall take some food and give the, uh, the, the macaque. And then the macaque started to like, you know, being intelligent, right? Oh, that sound, the plastic bag, food. Let's go a rush. She don't want to give me a, I go forward and I'll grab it. Then the, oh, the monkey attacked me. All because why? Because decades ago, or maybe even a century ago, people started to ruin and destroy this wonderful relationship. Do you know that the macaques that we find in Singapore, the long-tail macaques, are also known as crab-eating macaques? Okay, so they can hunt for, for they can go forage their own uh, leaves, fruits, insects, and if they want, they can go and go to the rivers and grab crustaceans and eat. They can dive underwater. All right, so please do not feed any animals. Or if you see an animal that's in distress, you really think that you you want to help it. You are not helping by feeding it. Okay, what you want to do right now is to go. We got a link that we'll share with you. Go and read up that you can be fined up to $10,000 for feeding animals in Singapore starting 1st of June this year, all right, because we really need to take a stand. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I didn't be able to finish this whole thing, but thank you very much. I'll take questions right now. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, Bernard, for sharing. Now, I know you've taken pictures of lots of other um, spectacular animals and we'd love to see more, but I think you've already covered some of the key principles that apply to photography of all sorts of species. And as Bernard mentioned, you know, you're more than welcome to connect with him on social media. Uh, we will share the links to his pages in the chat. So very quickly, we'll just uh, have one of the questions from our audience members uh, who are looking for some photography tips. So this audience member asked, some animals move quite fast and it's hard to capture good shots of them. Do you have any tips for this? Wow, um, absolutely. What, what you really need to do is to understand the fundamentals of photography, okay? So when, when the situation becomes more challenging, when you have low light, you have fast moving animals, uh, these two, what, what happens is, if you have a combination of the both, even worse. Okay, um, so what happens is if you have an animal that's moving fast, you will need to have a camera that can, a camera lens that can focus fast, one, and a camera that can take at least, so if you want to shoot a bird in flight, um, uh, like say an eagle diving, I, I'd say you probably need to shoot, depending on how steady your hand is to follow and track an eagle diving for it's, it's uh, a fish, for example, uh, you need to shoot anywhere from, to get it, decent uh, for the average person anywhere from like a thousand two hundred and fifty to two thousand five hundred of a second all right if you're really good very steady uh maybe you can shoot it at maybe one five hundredth of a second but you need to track it steady constant and you have good uh, background blur but for the for the average show i say between one thousand two hundred and fifty to two thousand five hundred settings that's your speed then you need a lens that can focus fast as well so um, some of the lenses actually have got a variety of, oh, sorry, a, 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 a range, a focus, a focal length range. For example, my, uh, my, my go-to lens, my $13,000 lens, you can, I can shoot, I can choose the distance between 2.7 meters to 7 meters. I can choose from 7 meters and beyond, or I can choose full, okay? So when I choose full, it starts to hunt from 2.7 meters all the way to infinity, okay? What happens is you are not giving the limitations to the lens for it to work at its optimal best. So if you know that, for me, if I knew that the, 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 the eagle that's diving to catch a fish is actually more than seven meters away, I would switch that setting to seven meters to infinity so that the camera and the lens can work seamlessly to pick up the subject fast. And then again, get your focus speed right, or sorry, your shutter speed right, and also 
steady yourself. If you, you find the camera lens too heavy, try going down to a slightly lighter lens. Maybe you've got to sacrifice your focal distance. But but get get the basics, get your what we call the record shot first. Get the shot that you want, but maybe not the ideal dream shot. Get it first, learn how you can um, grow and ex from this experience and, and improve this shot. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Any more, Leslie? Okay, thank you, Bernard. So, in, in summary, we need to uh, look out for like good lighting, you know, have a steady pair of hands, uh, set your camera to a uh, suitable shutter speed and suitable focal length. But of course, a lot of this takes practice to be able to balance all these different settings on the go. Yes. So finally, Bernard, you're clearly a very passionate advocate for our biodiversity. Could you share with us what is one takeaway from your conservation journey? Okay, so... I, I've been an NPARCS volunteer for about nine years now. I've been, I, I think I am one of the most hyperactive volunteers. I want, I want to experience things. I want to try things. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think the fundamental of my journey is that um, you need to be a team player with NPARCS or any organization that you're volunteering with. So if you're volunteering with ACUS, for example, you want, you're volunteering with NPARCS, um, the fundamentals is a mindset. Your, your mindset, you need to, to be a team player. You need to understand the perimeters that the organization works within. Um, your, your views that you bring to try to introduce, which you think can help, doesn't mean your, your personal view is the right way to go. So you need to, you need to know how you can help the world of conservation by understanding both sides and trying to work together. And that set of ideas that I've had has uh, been very fortunate for me to, to gain trust in working with NPARCS on, on crocodiles, uh, uh, with uh, the otters, and also marine turtles. I, I really wanted to talk about marine turtles because um, people get very, very, very um, taken away when they see a turtle on the beach, which is disastrous when you go too close. Okay, in fact, you need to keep like 20, 30 meters away. All right, but anyway, um, yes. So, so I understand the perimeters that is that the organization you're volunteering with has worked with them and remember that your views in conservation, uh, in, conserva in con conserving the, the, the world, the, the ecology, the biodiversity uh, is one way, but not necessarily the only way for now okay so yes thank you very much leslie mm. thank you bernard i think you highlight a key point about how biodiversity conservation is a collective effort and here at n parks we work hard to preserve not only what we have but to ensure that it thrives and we have a comprehensive plan called the nature conservation master plan to guide our approach. And if you're interested to hear more, do listen to the introduction of our first NPARC Spotlight talk, Creatures of the Night, which is available on our YouTube channel. In it, our group director, Lim Liang Jim, outlines this plan, which underpins our effort to build our city in nature. The link for this will also be shared with you in the chat. And you can find all our previous sessions of NPARC Spotlight on our YouTube channel. Just for you to see the richness of our biodiversity. And if you enjoy them, do share them with your friends and family. Although the Festival of Biodiversity wraps up today, there's still plenty of activities that you can catch for free as part of Ubin Day. You can enjoy talks and virtual tours of Pulau Ubin's kampong houses, freshwater and mangrove habitats and more. There's lots to discover, so head over to the Festival of Biodiversity webpage for more details or watch the live streams on the NPARCS SG YouTube channel. Now, every year at the Festival of Biodiversity, we've enjoyed public support through donations to the Garden City Fund, NPARCS registered charity. For those that have donated, our sincere thanks. Big or small, 100% of your contribution goes to supporting programs for our local biodiversity, such as through species recovery projects. For those who can and wish to help, please go to the link on my screen to make your contribution. This link will also be shared in the chat soon. Now, this is the 18th and final session before NPARC Spotlight takes a break. 
it's been an immense pleasure spending these weekend mornings with you, marveling at the wonders of our city in nature. Before I go, I have to thank each and every one of our speakers, all pictured here, who have given their time and energy for this series. Their smiles in these pictures clearly show how much they enjoy what they do. Also, our directors at the National Biodiversity Centre for their unwavering support and colleagues from the Communications and Community Engagement Team for the online logistics and publicity and everyone else supporting behind the scenes. And last but certainly not least, a big thank you to you, our audience, for your enthusiasm and encouraging feedback. Until next time, if you have any thoughts about today's session or want to tell us what you'd like us to share online, do fill in our feedback form by scanning the QR code on the left. You can scan the QR code on the right to join our mailing list and be notified of volunteer opportunities under the Community in Nature initiative. Once again, thank you to Bernard for today's session and for firing our imagination for the wildlife in our midst. Thank you to our audience for supporting the N Parks Spotlight series. I hope to see all of you again real soon, but till then, have a great weekend, take care and stay safe. Bye everybody.